Man, how are we liking this fall weather out here? Man, that's awesome, isn't it? All righty. If you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to grab them and go ahead and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you don't have a Bible, we got some on our resource table in the back, so feel free to get up and go grab one, and that way you can follow along with us, and you can take that home if you want. That's our gift to you. We love putting God's Word in people's hands. Uh, we're going to jump back now into our study through the book of 1 Corinthians. We took a little three-week break to kind of talk about our vision, which was fun, but, but I'm personally glad uh, to be back in our study through this wonderful book, and uh, we're picking up in 1 Corinthians 10. As you're turning, I just need to get something off my chest. I have a confession. Um, I, as a general rule, I see myself as a man's man, all right? I like pickup trucks and chainsaws and MMA, okay? I'm a man's man, but I confess there are some rom-coms that I do enjoy watching. Okay, there. <laughs> Had to get that out, okay? I know that puts my man card in serious jeopardy, but there are some, all right? Not many, And one of them is a movie called Fever Pitch. Now, if you're not familiar with the movie, uh, it uh, it stars Jimmy Fallon and Drew Barrymore. And in that movie, we get to watch Jimmy Fallon's character sort of try to unwind the complicated uh, twist of two loves in his life. But this is a little different than a lot of them. I don't like, in general, the love triangle theme. I just kind of hate that, i got to be honest. But his is a little different. He has to try to figure out how he's going to balance his new love, played by Drew Barrymore, and his lifetime love, the Boston Red Sox, all right? He is a diehard Red Sox fan, all right? I mean, he's got Yankee toilet paper in his bathroom, everything, right? I mean, he loves the Red Sox, and so he finds it complicated to carry these two committed relationships in the movie. It's a really humorous movie, and of course, it's a rom-com, so it ends happily ever after. But it does, at the end, communicate this truth, right? You can't carry two loves. You can't have two things that absolutely, positively hold your heart at the same time without tainting the other. Now, in the end, Jimmy and Drew get together, and they watch Red Sox baseball together. But, but it's clear at the end of that movie that something had changed in Jimmy Fallon's character. Something had shifted. And he was willing, as we see in the movie, to lay down his passion for his team in order to truly love her, right? Because those two loves were incompatible. So what we're going to talk about today in our text, we're going to be kind of faced with the same reality of two incompatible things, right? Two incompatible lifestyles. The life of a committed Christian who loves the Lord with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength, and the life of one who's indulging in idolatry. So let's go ahead and dive in together. 1 Corinthians 10. That's Philippians. It's the wrong book. I'm struggling today to find scriptures here. <clears throat> all righty. I think I had it off there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to start in verse 14. And I'm going to read down to verse 22. That's going to be our text today. Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak to you as sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Uh, Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Let's pray and ask God to give us wisdom. Lord, thank you for this text today, and I pray you speak it clearly. God, in spite of all my insufficiency standing up here, Lord, I pray your word would be true, and it would penetrate our hearts, and that it would transform us. I pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, well, let's do a very quick review of where we've been for the last few studies, especially since we took about a month off from our study here. Uh, what we have saw uh, is that Uh, Chapters 8 to 10 are really one little section here in this letter that Paul has written. 
Uh, and he's addressing in this section a question that the Corinthians had asked him about. Namely, what do we do with this meat that's been offered to idols, right? Corinth, of course, was a city full of idols, false gods. There were hundreds of different uh, Greek gods everywhere, and, and Corinth had them all over the place. And in these temples, there was the regular worship of these false gods, and it often included the sacrifice of an animal, and the meat from that sacrifice would make its way oftentimes into the marketplace, right? Right? And so, uh, these Christians, a lot of them were brand new Christians. They'd been saved out of a deep history with pagan practices. They were really conflicted. What do we do with this? I mean, should we eat it or should we not? I mean, if we eat it, are we essentially worshiping this idol? And others were going, oh, no, we don't, we're free. We don't, we don't, we're not bound to that, right? And so, to this question, Paul answers in a nutshell, it depends, don't you love that? Don't you love it when you have a hard question, you ask somebody, and they go, well, it depends. <laughs> it's like, that's not what I wanted to hear, right? I wanted a yes or no, all right? Uh, Paul essentially affirms in chapter 8 that, indeed, they are free in Christ, and they have the liberty to eat that meat because we know that those aren't really gods at all. They don't really exist. There is one God, Yahweh, right? And so that meat isn't tainted. And so you can go out in the marketplace and you can buy some and bring it home and eat it without uh, defiling your conscience. And you could go over to a neighbor's house and if they're eating it, then you, with some stipulations, you can eat it, right? But then he adds some, some regulations to this exercise of Christian liberty, Right? And these, we might not deal with this, but these exercises are helpful for us when we think about our Christian liberty. First of all, he says, when you're thinking about this issue, think about your brothers and sisters, right? Think about others. How's it going to affect them? Is it going to cause them to stumble if they see you eating that? And they go, well, you know, that was me offered to idols. And, and maybe they would be, even be drawn into what they think is sin. And if they do it, then it's sin, right? Because they're rebelling against what they think is right. And you drew them into sin. So he says, think about others, right? And he, he gives himself as an example of how wonderful it is to actually lay down your rights for the good of others and for the sake of the gospel, right? And then when we get into chapter 10, he, he warns them about the dangers of presumption. The dangers of presumption when it comes to this issue of idolatry. In other words, he, he gives them an example. He says, don't be like the Israelites in the wilderness, right, who thought they were okay with God because they had all these signs of God's grace in their life, but the reality is they were not. And they perished in the wilderness. And he goes, you guys are just like them. You've got the presence of God, you have the provision of God, you have the signs of God's grace and the sacraments of baptism and communion, but don't let the existence of those give you a presumptuous heart because that's dangerous. And he gives them a stark warning. And I think it's a warning to all Christians, maybe even particularly Christians who've been walking with Jesus for a long, long time. Sometimes we sort of begin to presume upon God's grace and we persist to pursue sin in our life. Well, in our text today, Paul is building on this idea. And he's going to build on this exhortation concerning these idols. And, and to me, uh, the, the, the main message is simple. Don't play with them. Don't have a presumptuous heart, don't, and don't live with a compromising lifestyle. So your main idea, you can see it on the screen there, is simple. Don't toy with idolatry. Don't mess with it. I think in these verses, we see three movements. We see Paul's command in verse 14. Then we see Paul's basis for the command uh, his, uh, in verses uh, 15 to 21. And then uh, he, we end with Paul's cautious warning. So let's look at those three kind of main categories in the text here, right? First, let's just look at the simple command to flee idolatry. Verse 14, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Now, once again, you got to love Paul here, right? He has given a very direct address and a very clear warning of a very real problem, but he does it with a pastoral tone. He calls them my beloved. And I don't know if that shocks any of you, but if you've been tracking with 1 Corinthians, they've been nothing but a pain in the butt for Paul, right? They've caused him heartache and headache, you know, head, headache, yeah, definitely. And we know that some people were slandering his character as a leader, and yet he says, my beloved, my beloved. And then he gives them a very direct command and warning. And those two, by the way, aren't at odds with one another. You can be very loving and caring while still being direct and giving warning to others. Right? Love doesn't mean the absence of doing that. And Paul here is masterful at it. 
in all his letters, and particularly we see right here. And so he can't be more direct and simple. Flee from idolatry. He's told him to flee from sexual immorality in chapter 6, verse 18. And now he gives that concept of spirit-filled flight and applies it to the issue of idolatry. Let's look at this call to run. The, the word flee here is the Greek word fugo. It means to escape, to avoid danger, to run away. Uh, quite literally, we derive our word fugitive from this word, right? It's a strong imperative verb, and it's in the present tense in the Greek language, which is important because that is a tense that means it's an ongoing action, right? So Paul is a saying here, on a daily basis, moment by moment, continuously run, flee, escape like a fugitive from the danger of idolatry. If you were a fugitive who had escaped from prison, how foolish would it be for you to linger by the prison walls? To speak through the fence at your fellow inmates. No, you wouldn't linger or flirt with the source of your captivity, would you? You would do what Andy Dufresne did in Shawshank Redemption and go to Mexico, right? You would get as far away from there as you can. Now, friends, I, I don't know about you guys, but I know for Rob Stevens, my fallen heart needs to hear simple calls to run sometimes. To not linger, to not toy with, to not play with where danger lies. And we like to do that, don't we? We love to ask questions like, where's the line, you know? And most of the time, we like to ask that question not because we want to make sure we don't stumble up on that line. We want to know how close we can get to the line, right? And so we play with it. We toy with it. And these Corinthian believers were definitely doing that. They were filled with spiritual arrogance, and they were, they were waving the flag of their Christian freedom and that catchphrase, all things are lawful, was sort of their, their mantra as they ran dangerously toward and many times way over the line into dangerous waters. They wanted to blend with the culture around them. And if you were going to blend socially in Corinth, that meant one thing. You had to be a part of temple life, right? If you weren't, then you just were a social outcast. You were weird. And they were going, you know what? We can do this. We can go and just sort of be there for the social aspects because we know those guards aren't, gods aren't real. So we can go through all the motions there, go along with the crowd, and we're okay. But Paul's yelling, no, don't do that. Run away from that mess. Now, what's the application here for us? Well, I think there's an obvious application that we need to not toy with things that we know are deeply seated in the work of the enemy, Right? Uh, certain like occultic practices that are still alive and well in our world today. We just need to stay away from them, even, even if we know that the stuff behind it's not real, right? I was out at Free Fest a few weeks ago, and there was a tent up there, and they had the like tarot cards out there, right? And I'm thinking, you know, I wonder how many Christians are actually just coming up because they're curious, you know, and they just kind of want to play around with this stuff. I know it's not real. Let's just have fun with it, to which Paul would say, that's stupid, Flee idolatry. Now, he's going to get to this in a bit, but he reminds us that even though those gods aren't real, there are very real spiritual forces at work, namely demonic forces. So run away from stuff like that. Don't toy with that. Don't read your horoscope because you think it's fun or get advice from a palm reader because you think it's fun. It's not fun. It's dangerous. Get away from it. However, let me just say this. I don't think that that's the issue for most of us when it comes to idolatry. Now, the reality is, most of us don't find ourselves struggling going to pagan temples, burning incense to statues and things like that. Maybe some of you do, but most of us, that's not us. For most of us, we need to think about this a little deeper. Is that the only application to stay away from a pagan temple or some occultic practice? Well, we need to ask the question, what is an idol? To kind of get at that, right? And so I'm going to, there's nothing new under the sun. I'm going to borrow from Tim Keller's helpful little book called Counterfeit Gods. I recommend it. It's a great read. Keller writes this. He says, what is an idol? It is anything that is more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything that you seek to give you what only God can give. He goes on. An idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I feel my life has meaning. Then I'll know I have value. Then I'll feel significant and secure. Whew. Now that just busted up the gates of idolatry for most of us, didn't it? 
It's helpful. It reveals sort of the hidden nature of idolatry. In other words, I don't know if you caught that there, sometimes an idol is not something inherently evil. In fact, oftentimes, maybe most often, idols are very good gifts from God that became gods to us. Uh, It's the way Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 1, 24 through 25. He's talking about people who have rejected God, and he says, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Why? Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. Amen. Now, again, in that context, a lot of times it would have been an actual creature that they made into a graven image like a cow or something like that. But do you see, any time, anything, uh, time that a created thing, even a really good thing, like a spouse or a good cup of wine or your favorite sports team, any time anything becomes an object of our worship, that thing is an idol. Keller goes on. He gives us some really helpful, uh, good diagnostic questions here. How do, we, how do we find these idols? He says, well, we can locate them, an idol, by looking at our nightmares. What do we fear the most? What, if we lost it, would make life feel like it's not worth living? He goes on. We can locate idols by looking at our most unyielding emotions. What is it that makes us uncontrollably angry, anxious, or despondent? What racks us with guilt we cannot shake? Those are really good questions, Right? And they, because they kind of peel back the veneer a little bit and help us see that idolatry is maybe more of an issue in your life than you thought. So those of you who came to texts like this and go, ah, not applicable, ancient, ancient issue I don't need to deal with, my guess is when you ask those questions, you might see a multitude of areas where we might need to apply in some way flight, right? Now, what does that fleeing look like? Well, that's, that's a really good question. You need to maybe sit down with a good friend with and, and talk about, maybe ask these questions and try to dig in and see what, what are the idols in your life and what does fleeing look like? Because, you know, if your spouse has become an idol and it, it happens all the time, you shouldn't flee from your spouse, all right? But there are ways to flee, right? And, and, and Paul here is, is telling us, man, this is, don't mess around with idolatry. It's serious business. And so, after this, Paul lays out an argument for us, right? You have to love the way Paul frames this. He says, I speak to you as sensible people. And sometimes I'll read this letter, I'm like, are you sure, Paul? Right? But he says, I speak to you as sensible people, judge for yourself what I say. I like that because Paul goes, look, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you some truth here, but like, don't just take what I say at face value. Think about it. God's given you a brain. If you're a Christian, you have the Spirit of God. Think about it like sensible people people. So he lays out the case for fleeing idolatry. And where does he go for his argument? Maybe where you didn't expect. He goes to the table, the Lord's table, to drive home his case. And the basic argument that he's making is this. It's incompatible for you to eat at the Lord's table and at the table of demons. Going into these temples and participating in the practice of these worship rituals, it's incompatible with your covenant relationship with Jesus. Let's dig into that. He writes here, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So what's Paul doing here? Well, he's wonderfully pulling out for us the power of what is being proclaimed and experienced as we come to the table. Namely, he's bringing out the power of two different unions in our life. First, let's notice that the Lord's table reminds us of our union with Christ. He says the cup of blessing. Now, what is that? Well, that's a Jewish uh, term. Uh, It was often used for the cup at the end of the meal that they gave thanks over. So that was the cup of blessing. It was also the official title of the third cup in the Passover feast. Here's what we do know that Jesus did on that night. Matthew 26, it says that he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, there it is, the cup of blessing, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So Paul's saying, brothers and sisters, 
Don't you know that when we drink of the cup and come to the table, it is a, did you catch that? Participation with the blood of Christ. Now, I hope we're all learning how to not just come and listen, but to be active readers and studiers. And if you've read, read of this, you'll know that word participation is really important to this text. We see it four, time in the, four times in this short passage. He says, we participate in the blood of Christ. We participate in the body of Christ, verse 16. The Israelites, he said, participated in the altar. And then he warns them, I don't want you to be participants with demons in verse 20. That word participate is a Greek word that we're, most of us are probably familiar with. It's the word koinonia. It's the exact same word that, that uh, has the, the root koinos in common. And it's the same word that we looked at a few weeks ago when we were going through our vision, talking about what does it mean to cultivate biblical community. And we looked at Acts chapter 2, that little snapshot of the first church. And we said one thing that made them up was their koinonia. Their fellowship, they had all things in common. And Paul's essentially saying here, friends, don't you know this? You have koinonia with Jesus. You have communion with him when you come to the table. Now, it doesn't mean that's the only time we have communion with the Lord. Rather, I think what Paul is saying is that the regular act of taking communion, and I believe as I read this, he is making an assumption that Christians regularly come to the table. The regular act of taking communion brings to you a strong sense of the realization of the union that you have with Jesus Christ. You're participating. Now, I don't think that Paul is saying here, as our Roman Catholic friends would believe, that that the actual body and, and blood of Christ, the elements become the actual body and blood of Christ there. Rather, he's saying we are sharing, we are participating in communing with the blessings of Christ, right? Note how he He ties this thought to the altar in the Old Testament, verse 18. He says, consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? Well, of course, he doesn't mean that they're actually eating the altar, right? He means they're sharing in the blessings and the benefits of the altar, namely the atoning of their sins. And so it is with the Lord's Supper. When we come and we partake, we are sharing in the blessings that have already been freely given to us through the once-for-all sacrifice of Christ obtained by faith. We have blessed union with our perfect Savior and the Father. Do you know we have in common with Christ? That's what koinonia means here, right? We have in common with Him His righteousness. You go, well, wait a second, I'm not righteous. You dang right you're not. But in Christ, you have been declared righteous. We have in common with him his purity, his perfect holiness, his communion with the Father. As we come to the table, by faith, friends, we are reminded of this. And that's why it is nourishment for our souls. People say, why do you do communion every week? It's good to feed our souls in this. And we're not feeding our bodies with that little wafer and drink. We're feeding our souls all in the hope of all that was accomplished on the Christ, on the cross by Christ. So we are united with God, uh, with Christ. But also notice here he talks about our union with God's people, the church. And so the Lord's table also reminds us of our union with the church. Look at verse 17. He says, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of one bread. Now that is an amazing little verse. He's reminding us that by virtue of our union with Christ, we have covenant union with God's people. Well, which is why, church, we say each and every week when we introduce the table and we do what is called fencing the table. In other words, we, we want people to not just kind of go through the motions, but we want you to know what you're doing and whether you should do it or not, Right? So each and every week, we say uh, that we're making a proclamation that is vertical and horizontal. We're making a a proclamation of our union with Christ and our union with one another because the one bread makes us one body, right? And so, just as we should refrain coming to the table if we're not communing with Christ, a.k.a. if you're not a Christian, you shouldn't come to the table. You don't have union with Christ. Or if you're not living in step uh, with that union, a.k.a. there's unrepentant sin in your life, so too we ought to refrain if we're not living in covenant relationship with his people. This is why we put those, it's biblical. We didn't just come up with that out of the air. 
Because you're making a proclamation that isn't actually in practice true of your life. So guys, don't you see, this is a powerful thing when we come and take the Lord's Supper. We are participating with Christ and with one another. This intimate fellowship, and I do believe that there is an imagery here of intimate fellowship. And this is exactly the point Paul is making in his grander argument here, because he wants them to see the incompatibility of that union with the union of demons, which is where he takes us next. Notice he teaches us here that the table of idols is uniting with demons. Uh, Look down at verses 19 and 20. He says, what do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. And I don't want you to be participants with demons. So Paul is really a masterful writer. He almost anticipates an objection here. Paul, it sounds like you're flipping on us here, and now you think these gods are real. And Paul's like, no, let me just clarify. I'm not implying that at all. I don't think that Aphrodite or Apollo or any of the other uh, Greek gods are actual gods. But just because they're not real doesn't mean they're not real spiritual forces at work. And I talked about this. Christians, we, we need to not think like naturalists. We're not naturalists. We're super naturalists, Right? Now, we know that there's a spiritual realm and there's spiritual warfare going on around us. And our, our striving in this life isn't just against the tangible things in front of us. Paul writes in Ephesians 6, 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So he says, look, that idol- that's idolatry. And make no mistake. The worship of a false idol involves a very real evil spirit. Demons are at play here. And it's actually demons that you're sacrificing to. And if there is a participation, a fellowship, a communion that happens when we come to the Lord's table, then you better believe that the same is true when you come to the table of an idol. You are indeed participating with demons. You're uniting yourself with the work of them. That kind of pops, doesn't it? This idolatry thing isn't harmless. It's not just, well, I struggle with this a little bit. It's flirting with really deep things. Paul says they're incompatible. They just You can't come to the table and then come to that table. If Paul were from Burke County, North Carolina, where I come from, he would say, that dog don't hunt. You can't do that. That won't fly in the eyes of God. You are one with Jesus and with his bride. Therefore, you can't mix that with demons. This is the exact argument, by the way, that he gave in chapter 6, this union argument. Remember chapter 6 where he's talking about sexual immorality and he says in verse 15, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? That's union, communion, fellowship language. And he goes, well, shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. That's scandalous. That's offensive to God. And so it is with idolatry. Paul goes, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. The word partake there is the word mateko. uh, And it means literally to share in, to belong to. You can't belong to the Lord and belong to demons. You just can't. And so after showing this clear incompatibility with a really solid argument, he warns them and us of the consequences. No, finally, the caution when considering idolatry in your life. This isn't hard to understand. Look at verse 22. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? And Paul is lovingly but forcefully saying, don't be a fool. Are you so foolish that you would stir up the jealousy of God? Charles Hodge writes here, he says, Jealousy is the feeling which arises from wounded love, and it is the fiercest of all human passions. I think we'd all agree with that, isn't it? It is therefore employed as an illustration of the hatred of God toward idolatry. It is as when a bride transfers her affections from her lawful husband in every way worthy of her love to some degraded offensive object. The illustration, feeble as it is, 
is the most effective that can be borrowed from human relation and is often employed in the scriptures to set forth the heinousness of the sin of idolatry. 20 years ago, I stood before friends and family across from Denise, and the two of us made covenant vows to one another. We committed ourselves in covenant relationship with one another. And I can tell you this, as her husband, I will not share her with another man. I just won't. I'm rightly jealous over my wife. And nobody with their right mind would say that's a bad thing. We, we tend to almost always put jealousy and make it like it's a bad thing. It's not in that case. It'd be weird if I was okay with that. And friends, so it is with our God. In his divine-sized love, he has sent his son to die for our sins, to buy us from our sin debt and make us his bride. And he won't share us with another. Listen to what he says in Deuteronomy 32, 21 through 24. He's talking about Israel, his people. He says, they have made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with what, those who are no people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled by my anger, and it burns to the depths of Sheol, devours the earth in its increase, and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. And I will heap disasters upon them. I will spend my arrows on them. They shall be wasted with hunger and devoured by plague and poisonous pestilence. I will send the teeth of the beasts against them with the venom of things that crawl in the dust. You go, well, that's not the God I want to worship. That sounds like a big meanie God. He is a God who's rightly jealous over his people. Guys, I don't know. To me, this is like, wake up, church. Wake up, Rob. Are you going to play around with idolatry in your life? Are you so foolish as to incite the right jealousy of God? And he just brings it home with one last question. Are we stronger than he I said, that's a question that doesn't even need answering. Of course not. We cannot successfully tend with God. Let's work this backwards. Therefore, we shouldn't stir up his jealousy by making ourselves united with demons when, in fact, we're united with Christ. Therefore, flee idolatry. See the flow of the argument. I don't know where this scripture finds you this morning. Maybe you came here today and you don't, have communion with God because you're not a Christian. The reality is that was everyone in this room at one point. We were all born into sin, and by our sin natures, we are separate from God. We are stated as rebels against God, and we deserve His just wrath. But friend, please consider with me the gospel message, and the one that we're going to be putting on display here in a moment as we take communion. God loved His broken creation. And he provided a way for sinful humans to have communion with the holy God. That's crazy to think about when you really stop and meditate for a moment. The only way was for his justice to be satisfied. And it could only be satisfied by a sinless substitute taking our place and becoming the object of that justice. And that's what Jesus did. It's not just a good man who was a good teacher who happened to be the, at the wrong end of a, a, an unjust justice system. No. Jesus came and he lived as man, fully God, fully man, and then he lived a life of perfect righteousness and a holiness that we can never live, and then of his own volition. Nobody took his life. He allowed his blood to be poured out, his body to be broken. He gave himself in death on the cross to take the justice of God on himself. And it, it the cross, friends, is beautiful. It is the perfect intersection of God's justice and God's mercy. His justice satisfied in the death of his son and his mercy given to undeserving sinners by faith in that son. And you, my friend, if you're here and you're not a Christian, you can have union with God. I just want you to hear that. You can have fellowship with the one who breathed life into you. And the way you do it is through faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Would you put your faith in him today? And brother and sister, what's our application? Will we hear this word as we should and take the exhortation to flee idolatry seriously? You may be asking, how do we flee? We asked that a little bit earlier. 
How do we flee idolatry? Well, certainly there are practical things we ought to do. Like Paul would go, just don't go to the temple. Like that's simple. Stay out of the walls of that place, right? And maybe there are things like that for us. But think about it this way, just to give an illustration. The best and most effective way I could flee adultery in my marriage is to pursue with all my heart affection for my bride. That's the way I flee adultery, not by staying out of every corner where an attractive woman might be. No, I just need to daily seek to cherish Denise, to know her, to treasure her. And sometimes I'll, I don't do this enough, but I'll roll over in the morning. She'll still be asleep. I just look at her, cherish her. If I do that, then the likelihood of me being lured away to some, someone else is greatly minimized. And so too it is with fleeing idolatry. And the best way to flee idolatry is to pursue treasuring Christ. We get sucked into idolatry. We don't treasure Jesus. So just take those wonderful, you know, we're always looking for something crazy and cosmic. God has given us wonderful means of grace to treasure him by. The fellowship of his body, the church, coming and worshiping regularly and hearing God's word preached, treasuring him through song, coming to the Lord's table on a regular basis, and being poured out and washing our feet as Jesus did, right? To be still and know that he's God. And just slow down. This world is crazy busy, too busy to just simply treasure him. I have a, a group of pastors I meet with every month, and uh, in, in one of our meetings, one, one of our dear friend of mine, he just kind of asked us to pray for him. He said, guys, just pray for me as a parent, because I'm just struggling to find joy as a parent right now. And uh, he said, I just find myself frustrated with my kids way too much, agitated by them. And, and here's what he asked prayer for. I love, love, love this. He said, can you guys just ask me about this and pray and I'll just stare at my kids a little bit more this week. I just need to look at them. I just need to see them play. Watch them learn. And just see what a gift they are. I just need to stare at them and treasure them. And I thought, oh, how that applies to this text. We just need to look at Christ and treasure him. We just need to stop and stare at Jesus more. Just don't think we're doing it. It's got way too much stuff distracting us from just stopping and staring at Jesus, from playing the role of Mary and just sitting at his feet and going, feed me, Lord. Look, I don't know how God is calling you to respond, but I pray that you respond today to whatever he's pressing in on you. Let's pray. God, thank you for this word. Thank you for your mercy and grace and kindness. Thank you for giving your life so that wicked sinners like myself could be made right and have union with you. Jesus, it's not just a song we sing or a sermon that's preached. It's a reality. You are sweeter than honey, Jesus. May we treasure you and flee idolatry, God. I pray if someone's here today and they don't have union with you, that today would be the day of salvation for them. Save them, please. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, for Christians here, as we think about just how sneaky and deceptive idolatry is, that you will show us those areas, God, and that we will flee them, maybe very practically or pragmatically, but but maybe it's just a commitment this week to stop and stare at you, Jesus pray that we'll do that. We'll do that individually, and we'll do that together, Lord. God, we thank you for the table that we're about to come to right now, and I pray, Lord, that we will come with a different view, a different weight to what we're doing. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.